A strategy is a plan for action. Most people I know who struggle with repeating sins have not really thought in terms of a plan of action for how they're going to be victorious over it. Most men tend to think in terms of how to. So that's kind of how I think about this discussion. That I need a strategy, a plan for whatever my temptation is or my struggle. And because God is both my creator and the author of the scripture, it would seem to me that the best place for me to turn for my plan is to the scripture. Right? He knows my heart, he knows my soul, he knows my thoughts, and he knows precisely the plan that I need to have in order to be victorious over that. A biblical strategy is based upon three premises. I'm just going to give you one of those today, okay? Three premises. The first one is that we need to learn to think like God thinks. The second one is we need to do what Jesus did. And the final one is we need to live by the Spirit's power. Let me just take the second one. We need to do what Jesus did. The most, the most important discovery I've had in the last 10 years theologically that has impacted my life practically is to wrestle with and study the humanity of Christ. Now, I need to clarify that before we get started, just the theological background for that before we jump in. We believe that Jesus Christ was fully God. And when I think of him as fully God, I am drawn to worship him. I don't worship just a man. I worship God, right? But when I think, so I'm drawn to worship him when I think of his deity. But when I think of him as being fully man, I'm inspired to live like him. Let me see if I can illustrate it. A number of years ago, I was talking to a man who was in his 40s. He, uh, he had had some problems in his marriage. He was trying to put the thing back on track. And I had made this discovery, a discovery that I found by studying three verses backwards in 1 John. Okay? So here they are. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, which means that Jesus Christ was fully God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says... You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, which means that Jesus Christ, as fully man, he came in human flesh, never sinned. And then 1 John 2, 6, which says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked, which means that if I could discover the resources that Jesus used to be victorious over sin, those were the resources I was supposed to use. And so with this 40-year-old man, I was sharing that discovery. I said, you know, I know it's a little tough, but here's the deal. You know, you, if, if you learn to walk like Jesus walked, you're going to be able, if you learn to walk like Jesus walked, you're going to be able to see victory in these areas of your life. And I've never forgotten what happened. He slid back in his chair, he crossed his arms, and he looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, uh, Pastor, Jesus was God. I'm not God. Later that afternoon, I was home, and as was sometimes the way when I get home, uh, maybe your parents had this same occurrence. I would come in and my wife would say, um, kid number one is upstairs in his room. Kid number two is upstairs in his room. They need to talk to you, okay? So I slipped in. I'm talking to my daughter who is now eight years old at the time, and I cannot wait to share this theological discovery with her, okay? <laughs> That's right. So I say to her, Anna, you're never going to believe this. I know it's been a hard day, but listen, if you can learn to walk like Jesus, if you can learn to lean into the resources that he used, you're going to be able to do this. There's hope. Here's what she did. She crossed her arms. She slid back in the chair. And she said, Dad, as if I got to tell my dad this who's a pastor, okay? Dad, Jesus is God. I'm not God. And I remember thinking, have I spent my whole life making excuses for what I said I couldn't do because I never used the resources that Jesus himself demonstrated for me to use? In fact, Doug Bookman, to kind of square it away theologically, says this. In his incarnation, Jesus did not in any sense, to any degree, at any time or at any season, surrender any wit of his deity. Jesus did, however, take upon himself genuine human nature, and the scripture make it clear that Jesus' humanity, albeit unfallen humanity, was genuine and entire. Thus, as we read the gospel narratives of Jesus' life, it is important to remember that except at those occasional and relatively infrequent times when the Holy Spirit directed Jesus to access and employ the superhuman capacities which are a function of his divine attributes, he lived out his entire life under the actual and real limitations intrinsic to humanity. What? Jesus lived his life using only the resources that are available to you and me not to sin that thought just kind of settled in. How did Jesus know the scripture in Matthew 4 when over and over again with the Satan he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. It, it occurred to me that 
Maybe he didn't know that because he was God. Maybe he learned that and memorized those scriptures. Is that not what Luke 2 teaches? When it says, and he grew, that is, he grew in, in stature and in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Is that not what Hebrews 9 is teaching when it says, um, for he learned obedience through the things that he suffered, something as basic to the Christian life as obedience, Jesus learned right. through his suffering. And I began to say, what are those resources? And I went back through the Gospels, and I began to think, I've got to find him, I've got to find him, I've got to find him, because that's my answer. That's my answer. How we are victorious over sin. Here's four of them. We'll cover them this morning. Four resources Jesus used. And if they sound simplistic, I just want to tell you, before you say they're simplistic, you got to know, this is what Jesus did. Okay. This is what he did. It's his plan. It's not mine. It's not an acrostic. It's, it's, it's his plan, right? So here they are. Number one, prayer. Number two, the spirit. Number three, the scriptures. Number four, submission. Let's talk about prayer. Jesus prayed early, he prayed late, and he prayed even when he didn't get the answer he desired. Mark 135 says that after a very long day, he was up early the next morning praying. I kind of picture it like this. All the disciples are fast asleep. They're snoring in that room because it's been a long day of ministry. Mark 1 records the word immediately, it just, over and over again. It just feels like it's gone at a fast pace. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, Jesus' eyes snap open. He gets up to pray, not because it's an obligatory thing to do, but because his spirit desires it, right? Because he wants to talk to his father. By the way, if you say, well, if I was Jesus, I'd have wanted to pray too. I mean, think about it. After all, you know, Jesus is talking to his father and his father talks back. I mean, when I pray, I just hear silence. Can I remind you of this truth in the scriptures? Only three times in the gospel record does it ever recount that God the Father speaks audibly to Jesus. At his baptism, at his transfiguration, and in the final week of his life when Jesus is terrorized by the thought of the cross, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. What shall I say? Save me from this hour. Glorify your name. And God answers by saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Three times, that's it. The rest of the time when you read the gospel accounts, you should imagine that when Jesus prayed, His prayer was like your prayer. He prayed, and he didn't hear anything. He prayed, and he prayed that way because we know that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Mark 135, he's up early in the morning praying. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, by the time you get to Luke 6, he's prayed through the night, right? And he determines a critical decision, which disciples he will call on the tail end of that prayer life. And finally, in Mark 14, 36, When the other disciples fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus falls to the ground, does not lose focus in praying, and continues to plead with the Lord in prayer. There's a reason why in Matthew chapter 6, when it uses the Lord's Prayer, it says, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, because until you've learned to pray for daily needs, you cannot pray in your greatest need. Jesus taught the disciples to pray for daily needs, and when they did that, they could pray for their greatest need. Don't kid yourself. Don't wait for the biggest panic moment to learn to pray. Pray like Jesus. Pray like Jesus every day. Notice the Spirit. Take your Bibles and go with me to Luke chapter 4 for a moment. For only Luke records this in Luke chapter 4 verse 1. It tells us that Jesus was both full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit. It's interesting. That means that Jesus, who was fully God, though now operating under the intrinsic limitations of humanity, waited upon the Spirit of God to lead him and direct him. Full of the Spirit. He waited to move until the Spirit, Holy Spirit, was moving and directing him. He was led by the Spirit. When was the last time you asked questions of yourself regarding a decision, not what you wanted to do, but what the Spirit of God was directing you to do. In fact, we tend to think of that as kind of a mystical thing. I would encourage you that if you want to take a two pa- look at two passages that talk about how the Spirit directs, look at Romans 8, look at Galatians 5. There you will find terms like um, live by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, you will find terms like walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Let me just talk with you about living by the Spirit momentarily. Living by the Spirit. 
Quote these numbers for me if you could. 3, 3, and 30. Just say them with me. 3, 3, 30. Say them one more time. Three minutes is the longest that you can probably go without air, okay? and then you're going to die. You will no longer live. Right? Three days is the longest you can go without water, and then you're going to die. You will no longer live. Thirty days is the longest you can go without food. Not 30 minutes. Thirty days is the longest you can go without food, and then you're going to die. You will no longer live. Right? So you and I understand that for our physical bodies to live, we are absolutely dependent upon air Water, food, or else we die. Yet this text says, live by the Spirit. Am I that dependent upon the Spirit? I have a friend of mine, I was training to uh, run in the Philly Half Marathon with him this past September, and I had to back out because my allergies created some asthma-related things, but I was really looking forward to run with him because Mike is 56, so he's older than me, right? But Mike is legally blind, okay? So he runs, and he can't see anything, okay? So he runs between two guides, and he asked me to run as one of his, with him as one of his guides. He, he runs with a shoestring. That's all he's got. He's got this shoestring, and the one on the left has a shoestring, and the one on the right has a shoestring, and he just runs, right? So I went running with him one day, and it's fascinating when you're running with him. I'm, we've done about a mile and a half, and he says to me, Phil, I can see, I can hear you're settling in, right? I said, what do you mean I'm settling in? I'm, I, I'm dying over here. He said, no, 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 your breathing's settled. He said, I can tell you've settled. He said, oh, we must have come to the hill. I said, why do you know we came to the hill? I mean, I can see the hill, but he's blind, okay? He says, because Kim just sighed. She always sighs at the bottom of the hill. Okay. <laughs> what? Okay. I'm telling you, while I'm running, I'm just running with him thinking, he is absolutely dependent upon the people who are leading him. They're the ones who keep him from running into people. They're the ones who keep him from running into trees. Okay? They're the ones who say, three, two, one, turn left. Three, two, one, turn right. Okay. And he just turns blindly. I shut my eyes for like about 15 seconds when I was running with him, and that was enough of that. Okay? Okay. Just to see what it was like. I'm telling you, it was like, I cannot imagine doing this. Yet, That's the dependence I am to have on the Spirit of God. So dependent upon His movement, so dependent upon what the Word, what He said through His Word to me this morning, that I'm making decisions throughout the day like that. Jesus was full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, and He ministered in the power, Luke 4.14, of the Spirit. Let me talk with you about the Scriptures. Jesus understood its meaning, wielded its power, and applied its truth. It's really fascinating when you think of the Scriptures and how, how when Jesus would say something from the Scriptures, the multitude would say something like this. They were amazed because he spoke as one, finish the sentence for me, having what? Authority. Authority. So we tend to think of authority as the guy who is the most dynamic communicator, the guy who screams the loudest. I remember hearing the story of a, of a little boy who crept up to his pastor's pulpit and he saw the pastor's notes and he's reading them and in the margin he saw where his pastor had written, weak point, yell louder. Okay. Okay. That's right. That's not good authority. Okay. Jesus never did that with authority. You know how Jesus had authority? This is priceless. Watch how, just read it and watch how Jesus takes the scripture and he gives them the meaning of the scripture And then the people are amazed and they say he speaks as one having authority, not as the scribes. For instance, when the Sadducees came to him and articulated something about the resurrection, Jesus said, what, have you not read? God said, I am the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He did not say, I was the father. This is the interpretation. He did not say, I was the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, which means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are no longer dead, but they must still be what? Living. He takes the scripture, he just explains it, and the people say he has authority. By the way, when Jesus is tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, Jesus isn't only the only one who quotes the scripture. Who quotes the scripture in that passage? Satan, he takes the scripture out of context and quotes it. Jesus brings a passage and puts it back in context and quotes it. Jesus understood its meaning. He wielded its power. Take your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. I'll show you that there. Matthew 4, verse 4. 
I don't know the significance of that, but you guys are Word of Life students, so which means you probably don't know the significance either, okay? <laughs> Matthew 4.4. 4. Here we go. Here's what we got. For the text says, but he answered as written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. At this stage in Jesus' life, he is very, very, very hungry. Google people have been 30 days without food, and you're going to see things like sores breaking out on their bodies. You're going to see their ribs protrude. You're going to see a strong carpenter's muscular hands that have now become almost like they, they tightened up. In fact, we know that physically he is like that because in Matthew's account, look, verse 11, after it's over, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus needs angelic ER, okay? He cannot feed himself in this moment. So the Father sends an angel to give him food, right? To put the bread, as it were, to his lips. Because if not, he can't feed himself physically. He is debilitated in this setting. But that's not what Matthew 4, 4 is about. I used to think it was. I used to think it was about the fact that, that Jesus was just really, really hungry, and so he was going to exercise his deity and turn a stone into bread, and he was going to do that for himself, and therefore, but, but then one day I did what Jesus would have known to do. I looked at the context of Matthew 4.4. 4. It's actually found back in Deuteronomy 8, where the text says, Moses is speaking to the Israelite second generation. He says this to the, guy, the, to the ones who are there. He says, listen, God did not feed your parents in the wilderness. What? He let them hunger. What? So that they would learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's the thing. When the Israelites were hungering in the wilderness, did they learn that lesson? No. What did they do? Every time they were hungry, what did they do? Complain. In fact, you can put that word in the blank for about everything thing that the Israelites did in the wilderness. They complained, okay? Here is what is happening in Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ is being tempted to say, God, where are you? Jesus Christ is being tempted to complain. And instead, he answers, Satan, do you not know that even when we hunger, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? He answers with the Scripture. That's what I mean by wielding it's power. What happened in my own life was that when I suddenly realized Jesus knew scriptures to answer specific temptations, was it changed the way that I looked at temptations. I began to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I should memorize scripture around the temptations I hear, because you know how that he sounds. The temptation sounds so real. It sounds, it sounds like it's got to be true, and it feels so real that I think I probably ought to do it, but it's only the Word of God, when Jesus says it is written, it is written, it is written, that blows away that temptation, that makes me realize that that's a temptation and it's deceiving me. So, because Jesus memorized Scripture within the intrinsic limitations of humanity, I needed to memorize Scripture. Let me show you how that works by way of illustration. I'm going to give you nine lies. Here they are. These are just general lies. You can do this with anything you struggle with. You can find your own lie. I would tell you that most people, when they look at the Scriptures, kind of look at the Scriptures like this. Remember, it's referred to as the sword of the Spirit, right? The Word of God in Ephesians chapter 6. Most people, when they have a temptation or a struggle, grab their Bible off the coffee table, blow the dust off, go to the concordance and say, I wonder what the Bible says about this. Okay. I want to tell you, that is so slow. You are cooked. Right? You have already fallen to the temptation. You've got to be able to hear the lie and answer with the Scripture because it's the answering with the Scripture that wields the power of the Scripture. This is your Bible in the case, okay? This is your Bible when you have actually memorized it and you're about to retrieve it when you need it. It might go something like this. The lie says, no one will know what you're about to do. Go ahead. Nobody's watching. But the truth answers, 
For no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom they must give an account, Hebrews 4.13. Or the lie says, the temptation is too difficult for you. And the scripture answers, there is no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it, 1 Corinthians 10.13. Or the lie says, you keep falling. You'll never have victory over this sin. But the truth answers, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1, 6. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. And the lie says, your past is too hard. You can't overcome it. But the truth answers, and this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the lie says... You can't change. That's just the way you are. But the truth answers, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And the lie says, God must be keeping something good from you. But the truth answers, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing will he withhold from him who walks uprightly. Psalm 84, 10 through 11. And the lie says, you can avoid the consequences. Your situation is unique. But the truth answers, for lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. It is a devastating fire that destroys the hell. It will wipe out everything I own. Job 31, 11 through 12. And the lie says, this temptation is so hard, God must want you to sin. But the truth answers, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted, neither tempts he any man, but everyone is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death, James 1, 13 through 15. And the lie says, don't, don't tell anybody about this. You can overcome this sin on your own. But the truth answers, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working, James 5, 16. You cannot possibly use the word of God and wield it like Jesus did unless you begin to memorize the scriptures in answer to the temptations you hear in your head. It's the truth of God used like that that helps us understand and stand victorious against the temptation. In fact, it's just a thought, but what we refer to in Psalm 22 as a prophetic psalm because it talks about the events of the crucifixion and the fact that there will be those who will pierce his hands and feet, that there will be those who, who will trade, roll dice for his garments. We tend to look at that as a prophetic expression but I would challenge your thinking that I think that why Jesus cries out on the cross from Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is because on the cross, he is leaning into the scriptures and remembering what it was that the Psalms had predicted. Therefore, meditating and reflecting upon that Psalm as he moves down through it, he does what we do. He goes right back to the top of it again and cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus expresses his concern to the Father from within the context of Scripture because he's memorized it. We're fond of saying, what would Jesus do? I, I want to challenge your thinking here this morning. Those are the wrong initials, okay? If you wait until your moment of temptation, you're sitting at your computer, you got your hand on the mouse, you're thinking you might go somewhere you shouldn't go, and you're thinking, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? You are way late in the game, okay? You're way late in the game. Here's the right question, WDJD, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? And the answer is this, Jesus prepared and so should we. Okay. Jesus prepared. You cannot stand against the temptations unless you have learned, first and foremost, to pray like Jesus prayed, to do with the scriptures what Jesus did, to walk in the spirit as Jesus walked, and then one final one, you got to learn to embrace the idea of submission. He affirmed his father's love and power, and he trusted his father's decision. 
In Mark 14, 36, we read this wonderful rendering, only here do we find this occurrence. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Students, whatever you are struggling with, whatever temptation you are facing, whatever difficulty you're wrestling with and you're struggling to submit your will to the will of the Father in this, I want to tell you, here's how you do it, just like Jesus. Jesus affirmed two things. He affirmed his Father's love and he affirmed his Father's power, Mark 14, 36. The word Abba is the Aramaic word that literally means daddy. Now, I have a 21-year-old daughter. Um, I have some other kids too, but I have a 21-year-old daughter who still calls me daddy. Okay? And I know that when she calls me daddy, she knows that she's going to get whatever she wants. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Okay? That's how it is. So, girls, I'm just giving you that in advance so that you know to talk to your fathers. Okay? She doesn't take advantage of that, but she understands that term is a term of endearment that means this, I know my dad loves me. I can say, Daddy, because I know my dad loves me. So picture this. Only three times in the scriptures do we hear, Abba, Father. Only here do we hear it from Jesus. Only once here. In his greatest hour of need, he is reaffirming that his father loves him. By the way, it's not the only time he does this. He does it in John 15. He does it in John 17. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. He, He reaffirms the father's love. He does not question the father's love when he is struggling to submit to the father's will. Secondly, All things are possible for you. He believes, without question, he believes in this moment of time that God can do something about it. He affirms the Father's love. He believes that God the Father is powerful enough to do something about it. And within that context, he submits to the Father's will. 27 years ago or something, I was a Word of Life Bible Institute student. I came up here, like many of you, I made a decision to come late. I was only like 10 days out from uh, doing something else with my life, and instead I came to Word of Life Bible Institute. One of the first things Word of Life did for me was they slapped a quiet time diary on my desk. And uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that, honestly. I mean, I'd grown up in a Christian home, and I'd read my Bible, but, but sitting there for 30 minutes, you know, so, so I opened it up, and I had three verses to read. And, I read the three verses, and they told me I had a half an hour to do my quiet time, and I was done in about 60 seconds, okay? So it said, you know, write down what the writer is saying. So I wrote that down. That took another 60 seconds. It said, write down how you can apply that to your life. I did that. I was done with my quiet time like in less than five minutes, which is good, because I had time to pray, and I looked at the prayer journal and said, oh, I'm supposed to pray. So I prayed, and I was done with that in five minutes. So here I was, completely done with my quiet time in less than 10 minutes, And it wasn't that I was efficient, I just didn't know what to do. But there was a guy, like, sitting right here. And I remember looking at him, and he was deep in prayer, and his lips were murmuring. And I just watched him, you know, because I was done, after all. So I just watched him. And I I kept thinking, and then he's scribbling down stuff. And, and, I mean, it it was really amazing. It was like God was in the room talking to him, right? I just watched him. And I was just loving it. I was saying, huh. So that's what it's supposed to look like, right? That's what I'm supposed to be like. And for that whole week of RA training, he sat there and I sat here and I watched him. And I thought, that's what I want to be like when I grow up. Fast forward the tape. 20 years later, uh, just a few years ago, I'm sitting in my office as pastor down in New Jersey. There's a knock on the door. A guy comes to the door and he... uh, he comes in and he lays out a life uh, that's been messed up with sin and he starts to tell me about it, right? Lost my first wife, he said, in an issue where I could not control sexual sin. So I lost that marriage. Um, I'm on a second marriage. I said, really, how'd you, it's not going so well, he said. I said, how'd you meet her? He said, I met her at a club. He said, she's not a Christian. We got married. Um, I, uh, I'm looking at him. And you know how sometimes sin kind of ages a person? They're older than they really should look. All of a sudden, right in the middle of the conversation, I realize that the man that I am looking at is 20 years ago the man that sat in that chair. And I, I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did, did you go to Word of Life? Yeah, yeah, I went to Word of Life. I went to Word of Life. Did, did you go this year? Yeah, yeah, I went that year. Were you in our training week? You were the guy. You were the guy that I wanted to be like when I grew up, right? And there he is, sitting there, so disappointed, 20 years of sin. And he says to me, and I say to him, so, so what happened? Right. Hmm. He said, 
I guess I just quit doing what I should be doing daily. What gives you and I victory in Christ, the Spirit of God encourages us to do the things that you are learning to do here daily, just like Jesus did them. And when you do that, you're leaning into Him exclusively, and you will find victory in the areas with which you struggle.